So this is our spotlight series. This is the order of events. Uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about why we're here. And these are our uh, guest speakers. And thanks very much for them. Uh, uh, so we have Dr. Fraser Mitchell from the Botany Department, Professor Iris Muller, Mar Dr. Mark Hennessy, Professor Anna Davis, and Dr. Keen O'Callaghan from the Geography Department. Now, Anna and Keen couldn't be here, so we've pre-recorded their elements and we'll be playing them. And also we have um, from Christine Morris, who in November presented out to us on uh, in the Department of Archaeology what they did at the Classics for their field trips. So we have a recording of that as well. And afterwards, we'll just have a short discussion on um, the digital assessment opportunities and challenges. Um, OK, so um, I'd also like to let you know that uh, Pauline Rooney is here. Uh, from academic practice and Pauline you may some of you will have met her and some of you may not and Pauline's going to help me um, this morning and uh, perhaps key and not keep an eye on the chat and admit any uh, latecomers that's great okay so why are we here well this um a spotlight series of events stemmed from the Digital by Design project, which Pauline is leading out on here in um, academic practice, and it's funded by the National Forum. As part of this project, we've done a lot of research on what are the best digital education practices across the different disciplines. And we have a number of reports which are in their final stages of copy editing, but are available up there, draft reports at the moment in the link there um, on digital education practices. And one of our key outputs is to develop community hubs, discipline specific community hubs. And as you can see there on the screen, we have three of them uh, set up, one for AHSS, one for STEM and one for health sciences. And in there, we are hoping to enable academics share their teaching experiences and practices and um, also to highlight events that might be uh, going on. Um, and other uh, output, outputs we have from the project are um, resources on our website. So I'm going to just see if I can get this to work now and show you um, on our web page. So is that coming up there, designing and delivering digital assessments? So I, I'm going to uh, share these. Um, so it's telling me my screen is paused. Can you see that um, uh, academic practice web resource at the moment? No. I can see your PowerPoint slide, Katrina. Okay, so I'll just reshare the screen then. Um, okay. Okay, so, so we have up on our web resources, we have web resources on designing and delivering digital assessments. So here's a structure here to help people uh, enhance their assessments using digital technologies. And um, we have a whole section on different types of digital assess assessments. And we're just building one at the moment on field trips. So that will be going up there shortly. So these are the type of things we'd like you to look at after this um, workshop and come back to us with any feedback feedback on how we can improve them. So I'll just move back into my uh, presentation um, here. So as I say, we'll have one on field trips and we'll have a template available for you as well. So there are the outputs. Outputs from the Digital by design, by design, that's why we're here and we have a whole sequence of spotlight events occurring. There'll be further events at the end of April and the beginning of May. Um, this particular session is, is focusing in on field trips and how, you, how we can use digital technologies to enhance uh, field trips. And today, the outcomes of this session is that hopefully you'll have a set of strategies um, that will uh, support the design or the redesign of a field trip using digital technologies. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. Um, this is Dr. Fraser Mitchell from Botany, uh, and he's going to talk about plants and the Irish environment. So I'll stop sharing here and I will let um, Fraser share his screen there. So welcome, Fraser. Uh -huh. 
So, sorry, let's get my screen saved. Uh, right. Um, so, hopefully, you can you can all see that. Um, sorry, let me just move that. That's yeah. Great. Okay. So, so I run. I'm the coordinator for a field trip we run for our junior sophomore students. So it is. Um, it's these. These are big, big class of science students who've spent two years together as freshman students, and then they they separate out into their, their disciplines. And many of them have never really been outside very much in the sort of habitats we're going to be lecturing them to. So the very first week we take them out, we want to bring them to a range of different habitats so that they familiarize themselves with them. So when they're sitting in lectures, they have some context. And it's also very useful for um, sort of social bonding, actually. It's very useful. So we run it over the first week of term. Um, and of course, with, with COVID coming along, um, Last year, we could see we were going to have a problem, and so we actually had to run it through Blackboard. So this is what, instead of having a meet and greet, this is what the students were greeted with. And so we had various sort of sessions on the Blackboard site with Collaborate, where we could actually talk to them like, like we're talking today, I suppose. But the thing was, how did we give them the field trip experience when they're all sitting in their bedrooms at home? And in the few months coming up to that, what we'd actually been doing was something different, which was we, we developed this thing called Five in Five, really spearhead, spearheaded by Jenny Mathelaine, who's the professor of botany. Um, and the idea was to make short little videos, which were five minutes long, in, in different sorts of habitats. And we would examine five of the iconic plant species and, and tell people about them. So we were in the process of doing that. Um, and so then we said, oh, we'll take this opportunity to, to gather material for our field trip. So for example, I was doing one on five peatlands plants, and, and you, can, you can link into these on the the Botanic Gardens website. There's lots, lots of them now. But when we were up there, we just did all the filming that I would have done in the field trip. So I, I we, we did about six or seven, uh, five to ten minute video clips, uh, which we then used uh, for each of the days in the field trip for each of our habitats, so that students could get an experience of the site. Um, and I suppose what one thing you're interested in is sort of assessments and stuff. And I, I suppose. One thing I always go back to the reason for assessments and, and students see assessments as a way of them being ranked and marked and I, I suppose that's what we use them for too. But in fact, for that reason, if something isn't marked, sometimes students don't engage in it. And so we use assessments as a way of getting student engagement. So the actual marks awarded for something could be pretty trivial, but if there's marks, they'll do it really. So that was an important sort of imperative in the way we, we planned this. Um, but the sorts of things we were doing with them remotely was things like getting them to collect plants in their locality and completing worksheets, which we could set up generic ones. I did one for alien invasive plants, which worked extremely well with a class of 85 students. I only had one student contact me because they were, they were struggling, which I was impressed with. Um, again, to, to ensure they looked at videos, we did with MCQs, pretty standard stuff. We gave them data calculations. Um, but then we did some novel things for that field trip. We actually made some videos in certain habitats, in, in, in woodland habitats actually, where there was no voiceover. And so in fact, that was part of the exercises. They actually then had to supply the voiceover to explain the, the aspects of the habitat. Um, so that was what they did. And then they had to upload that. Um, and we, we got them to do, do site assessments and stuff. So that's really focusing in on, on what we were doing for that particular trip. But I suppose really one thing that you're, particularly interested in today is, is sort of what we're doing sort of on, you know, going, going forward uh, and using online resources. Um, and one of the things we actually used that, that trip, we put together that remote one, which last time we ran that trip, we, we, we ran it in person, which was fine, but, um, and we, we intend to do that in the future. But in fact, you always get students who miss these trips for various reasons, but it's the beginning of the academic year. And in fact, it's very hard for them to repeat it. <laughs> Uh, and so we, we actually use the online resource as a substitute for those students and, and they, they seem to, to work well. The other thing in our school, and you'll be hearing from geography as well, we run about 20 field trips a year in the whole School of Natural Sciences. Um, and about half of those are overseas, mostly in Europe, but we run two trips to Africa, for example. And the video footage we, we take is very useful in preparation for field trips because there's a lot of trepidation which often students are reluctant to, to discuss and admit. Um, but 
many of them just haven't been to these areas and they're particularly nervous and it, it is really very useful to to show them the sorts of habitats and situations they're going to be in so we use that in in in, in trip preparation the other thing we can do with plants is is you can use uh, mobile phones to take photographs of plants and identify them in the field, which was something we poo-pooed in the past because it wasn't the way we like people doing it, but it's there now. So we, we've actually embraced that to a certain extent. Um, and also there is a lot of citizen science on recording organisms in different locations. So you take a photograph um, and it can be a plant or an animal, and then it, it's, it's geo-referenced and it's put into these, these big websites. There's one called GBIF, for example, which maps globally where things are found. And what's really important though is if you can verify what you've identified. And so because we're there with staff that are experts in those areas, we can then get the students to upload a lot of verified records, which is quite useful. Um, we also, online resources, a lot of plants are now being uh, genetically identified, I suppose, and we, a lot of genetic material. And so we, we have a colleague who uses that as an exercise, an online resource where they, they get genetic code and they have to try and identify the plants and see if they they get the same result they would using the traditional methods. Um, I put in drone flights in the field and I'm gonna leave that to my colleagues in geography. I wasn't sure they were gonna be here when I put this slide together, but they use drones a lot for their field work. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave them to talk about that. Um, another thing that, that's useful both before and after field trips, and sometimes when, when you're out on them is, is uh, Google Earth does time series. You can look at, at, at photographs of different age, area of photography and satellite imagery, of different dates, um, which is very useful in habitats, particularly coastal habitats. You can see how they've changed over time. Um, and the final thing is actually field trip assessment, getting the students to produce videos themselves. Um, and in fact, what we've purchased now is a little sort of handheld, it's like a, a tripod that you hold your mobile phone in, but it's got a, a microphone with the sort of furry stuff on it. And what we found is if you just use your phone on a windy day, it's impossible to hear what's going on. And these little microphones are really very effective. Um, and so we give these to students and let them generate video material. Um, and in fact, there was one, one course that was done just a few weeks ago uh, where they were surveying sites that in, in the Phoenix Park. And they were given the option to produce a written report or, a, or produce a video or produce a, 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 a blog of some sort. And the majority, quite a lot of the students picked the video end. And it was actually quite interesting that I was talking to the person who ran this, I wasn't involved, but said all the students who had lens reports um, picked the video option. And they found it, and it, she got a lot of feedback from them. They found that a much more, more rewarding way of, of, of you know, doing an assessment using the video. So it was quite interesting that that, that worked really well. Um, and it's something that I think we, we will use more in, in the future as well. So that was a sort of very quick run through really of, of what we've been up to and where we're going on this. And I'm really looking forward to learning more from my colleagues and picking up more tricks. But it's something that we will, we're just starting out on this and it's something we will definitely be building on. Uh, and we learn a lot from the students because they're much more tech savvy than us with a lot of these things, so, so which is great. That's right. great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fraser. That's, That's absolutely- share. Um, Super. Um, really appreciate that. And very interesting there, especially uh, the move towards using more and more digital tools within yeah. your field. OK, great. So we'll we'll move on to geography then. Um, Iris, if you want to, to start up there and share your screen and then you can let me know when to, to play the videos. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Has that come up? Can you see this okay? That's yeah. great. Yeah, thanks, Iris. Um, so this is really a, a collaboration between four staff here that I want to talk to you about. And it's a particular module that was a 10 credit module. It was supposed to be a residential field course. And of course, when the pandemic hit, we had to very quickly think on our feet as to what to do. So what, what we came up with is, was actually put together in a lot of time pressure and with quite a bit of stress. So, so I think if we, we were to you know, revise this now over the years, which is what we are doing, you know, we may be looking at, um, at continually ev evolving this, this module. 
But um, as, as uh, Fraser said, we, you know, geography is also a field subject, really. So what we do in geography with the students uh, in, in many different guises and from the whole width of the subject is to take them out and to make them aware of the meaning of place, the environment and how um, particular phenomena vary across space. And that's really what um, the key sort of learning objective of any field trip in geography is. Of course, there's a lot of different themes and geography is really wide ranging. So the challenge we had was how can we get students to experience um, this firsthand out in the field uh, during a pandemic? Um, and that's both the, the kind of human side of geography and the physical side of geography. So we came up with, um, with four day long projects. And in the end, now into the, the post pandemic time, this is actually merging into a kind of module that has an in person version in semester one. So um, we found that the benefit uh, of, of having an in person and an online option allowed students who are away on Erasmus exchange to still um, enroll and do some, uh, learn some of the skills that they need to have if they wanted to do capstone projects in geography when they returned. So that was one of our, our other key objectives with this. And so we now have an online version that runs across uh, either semester one or semester two, depending on when the students are on their Erasmus exchange. Um, then it's those students who can't attend um, our in-person version, which we are now sort of bringing on again in the, in the after times, the, the after pandemic times. Um, and then the marks are submitted in semester two. So the structure of the module is a, is a general welcome and introduction in the semester one uh, with a Q&A session that's, um, it, that was all online still last year. Um, it'll probably move then onto a combination of online and in person. And then we have uh, these four themed day trips that, and I'll focus here just on the ones that we ran purely online during the pandemic. And since then we have added other components here. And I think John Connolly is on this session as well, um, who's kindly stepped in and put together a, um, an in-person trip when that is possible for the students who are taking this module in semester one in the in-person version. So it's all, all a bit complicated, but it allows for more students to take this who are on Erasmus programs in semester one. And the, um, the idea here is that they, they go by themselves and conduct fieldwork in half to full day um, exercises in and around Dublin, or in fact, uh, during the, the first time we ran this in March 2020, or April 2020, when we were in the pandemic, where they were doing this along where they were living in the, within their 5k radius. Uh, we gave them an online instruction on how to do the field work for these individual days. Uh, and it covered both human and physical geography days. So we, we had um, the four projects and uh, one of them was very physical. One of them was a sort of crossover project and the other two were human geography projects. We gave them an introductory session on each of the days in the morning online with the respective uh, staff. And then they were given instructions as to what to do during the day by themselves independently within their 5K radius. Um, and then they had uh, readings that they were given as well on particular field topics and tasks. And of course, and you asked uh, us, I think, to talk about some of the challenges. Um, a real challenge here, particularly for me as head of department, was the worry that something was going to happen to the students if they went out by themselves measuring things or, you know, crossing the road, uh, trying to do, you know, observations um, as part of their projects. So the risk assessments became a really uh, important component of this and the safety of the students. And actually it meant that I think the students became more aware of these issues than they would have otherwise been if we had run a sort of, you know, staff led field trip. So all in all, um, I think they, <clears throat> they became a little bit more aware of needing to ask themselves questions like, is it safe? Is it ethical what I'm doing here? I'm walking around you know, somebody's garden and digging up a bit of soil to analyze. Um, what does it mean to work ethically in research? And 
also, uh, is it appropriate what I'm doing? You know, what is what actually is my research question? Um, what's the meaning of precision versus accuracy in what I'm doing? I'm, I'm out here. I have to I have to make decisions as to how I sample uh, a, pe a bit of soil or how I take down particular notes. And they had videos on Blackboard, um, and they were encouraged to work in groups where they could, uh, either by being online or exchanging their their details and working with one another remotely. So that um, all in all, they were learning key geographical research skills. Um, they were learning to take individual responsibility for what they were learning. Um, they were encouraged to participate actively. And, and I think they probably did, or some of them at least, a certain types. And this is interesting what Fraser was just saying about the, the students on the lens reports who really grabbed an opportunity with the videos, um, I think we probably saw students who might have otherwise not participated as much, participate a bit more because they could do this independently. They they learned to be confident in conducting field work, which um, for us was a main objective to get them uh, to do that in in if, so that when they take on capstone projects, as this is a third year module, that they uh, they can do that confidently. They learn to frame, develop, and conduct research and be critical. And, and respectful when conducting the research um, as well. And of course, uh, we had also a lot of emphasis on what it means to collaborate with other, other people when you do research and to be mindful of plagiarism. And so, so these four days are these individual elements and I'll just give you a quick run through the, the soils day. Now, uh, in this, on the soils day, they, they got a, an introductory lecture that was online that they were listening to and it basically outlined the different, the four, five different factors that form soil and the meaning of soil in terms of ecosystem services provision and so on, so theoretical background to it. And then they were um, instructed, and I'm making this all very short here, but they were instructed basically to find contrasting sites within their five kilometer radius to go out and sample soil um, using specific methodologies. And some of them went into their urban back garden and looked for different microhabitats within their gardens uh, to analyze the soils as, as this student did. Um, these are images taken from the students' reports that were submitted. Others went into more rural settings and sampled soils in forested areas or in agricultural areas as well. And what the students then did is they were encouraged to uh, enter the latitude and longitude of all of, of their sample locations on a Google a shared Google spreadsheet. And then there is a facility in, in Google, it's called My Maps where the spreadsheet is directly converted into a map with the locations of all of the, the samples that were taken. So these, uh, these are all the locations that the students in the lockdown uh, had accessible to them in their 5K radius. And at each of those locations, they analyzed the, the soils that they sampled. Um, they, they used visual techniques for describing the soil and they used um, vinegar, for example, to look at calcium carbonate contents in qualitative, in a qualitative sense with, within the soil. So these are really kitchen tabletop methods for analyzing soils and they had to have a hot press to dry the soil for a while. Uh, and then the data was entered into an online spreadsheet. I've blocked out the emails and their names here on the left, but this is the, the, the spreadsheet that they then put their, their soil sample reference and the, all the details into. Um, they, did a, they had a access to a number of different apps on their phones, for example, to determine soil color, uh, but also to determine slope angles. And there's numerous applications now available that they can download onto smartphones. Um, and then they uh, they described the soil by way of its structure and so on, and whether there was any soil fauna or mineral deposits present. And they had very clear instructions as to how to do that. And then in this uh, My Maps application on Google, um, it allows you to then click on any of these locations, and it comes up with the attributes for you to look at. So they were then instructed to. Um, to either describe just their individual soil sampling and results or to draw on the whole of the data set and frame a project uh, with a research question and the presentation of the results and some examples shown here, and then the interpretation and an analysis. And, and so a little mini kind of mini project, mini capstone project in, in effect, but it was only a 1,500 
word uh, long report. Now, listening to Fraser, I think, you know, it'd be great maybe if in future we can also um, give them the option to present something or submit something that's a, um, a video record rather than a written record. But we particularly wanted them to also explore sort of data presentation skills that might be useful then for their capstone project. So that was one of our, one of our particular um, aims here. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the end of, of this. And then I think we have some videos for the other for the next one, don't we, Katrina? That's correct. Um, so I'm going to share here now and. Um, we are, of course, on, um, let me see if I stop sharing, that's the wrong screen. Um, uh, get out of that, okay, sorry. I need to share the videos with you, um, which are on my desktop and now, that's probably the wrong one, is it? It's the other one you wanted first, this one. So this is um, Kean's um, recording, I think. Can you see that? Is that coming up? Hi, so I'm Kean yeah. Callaghan, um, and this is a section okay. of our residential field module, which we ran in geography um, in 2020 in a virtual form within the student zone 5K. This day, they looked at land use, change, planning and development within the student zone 5K. So this will be an image familiar to most people, uh, the app designating what could we could get to within our 5K during COVID restrictions. And we use this as a lens really here to get students to interact with their own environments and apply geographical skills to them. So what this does is it really kind of uh, provides a novel lens to think about the urban environment in particular, because you know we're all kind of out on these circuitous walks throughout that period of time and students are very familiar with their own environment and can really see kind of both developmental changes happening within them, but also kind of what's there in terms of resources and what's not there and get a critical eye on that. So capitalizing on this then, um, it asks students to think a little bit about the urban changes that were taking place within their own 5K and to try to apply skills from urban geography and from urban field work as a way to interrogate those things. So this is some pictures from my own 5K at the time. We can see some of the development sites in stall form and very get a sense of, you know, uh, the kinds of changes and transformations that are happening to an area over that period of time, coupled with what's there and what's not there because we can't really get out of that 5K. Along with this, we have a situation in cities and in urban environments more generally where um, cities and urban environments are influenced by a whole range of factors and actors that are well beyond the scope of even um, the city boundaries itself, never mind 5K. So in this sense, we, uh, in this section of the field course, ask students to think a little bit about the ways in which their urban environments were both um, reflective of the communities that live within them and their own experiences, but also maybe influenced by actors and processes and finance and other kinds of activities that extend well beyond that area. So the set of methods we try to use then try to bring those two things together. So on the day itself, students were asked to kind of consider the following. So the, the section aims to, you know, look at the aims and ambitions of development projects to see what's called the relational character of urbanization, how it's conceived in relation to elsewhere, whether that's, you know, whether a particular development might have an influence of finance or other kinds of actors coming from outside of the state, or whether, for example, in a commuter area outside Dublin, there is, you know, a housing estate being built, which is conceived in relation to people move you know, commuting in and out of Dublin for work, for example. Uh, students are asked to think about the urban governance arrangements involved, so who has a stake in deciding what urban development takes place and in what ways, and then think a little bit about the power relations involved, so whose voice is heard and whose is excluded in these kinds of conversations. And so with this then, um, we've got two methods that students were asked to use. So in the first instance, they're asked to kind of prior to going on the field day itself, engage in a process of policy analysis and stakeholder identification. 
Um, so mapping out kind of who are the set of stakeholders involved in a single development site, which they would pick prior to uh, going out in the field day itself. Do some research, create planning documents, create media research, think a little bit about kind of what are the development priorities, who are the different sets of actors, and maybe what are their different points of view on whether a particular development is uh, should go ahead or it shouldn't, for example. And then secondly, they're asked to think a little bit about through skills of observation, field note reflection and interpretation. So using a set of uh, ethnographic field note approaches, they go out on the field day themselves, take photographs, take detailed notes of what's there, and then use that as a basis to both evaluate the set of stakeholders and the kinds of contestations that are happening within a particular development, but also their own reflections on what that particular development might add or not to their own community and their own 5K designation. So that was Keen O'Callaghan. Thanks very much, Keen. That was also very interesting. Um, I think Mark, you were due to go ahead next if you if you want to fire ahead. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so my, my day was looking at reading and recording the urban landscape, and the idea there was to get them to look at how uh, urban landscapes develop over time, and how to record that information about these urban landscapes. Um, in the field. So we looked at an area just to the east of college uh, in the uh, Trinity Ward and uh, we, we de I developed that because uh, it was it could be used very easily then as a, an actual in-person um, field, uh, field course as well as an online one. So what we concentrated on was public housing. So rather than looking at the entire landscape, we took out a strand of the landscape and tried to look at the uh, the changing impact of public housing developments on the urban landscape and the in the course of the the, the field trip what we looked at was how uh, power relations changed over time the different actors involved the different forces involved in shaping the urban landscape and what the outcomes were of that so we looked at developments from around 1900 in the 1920s on through the 1930s with the great uh, developments of the 1930s and then right up to the 60s and the 70s, uh, really stopping about in the 1980s. So the idea was to get them into an introduction to how to observe and how to record the urban landscape and then to move towards analysis of that. Now, obviously, uh, we couldn't <clears throat> go out into the field, so I decided to do this simply using uh, Google Maps Street View. It's a very straightforward approach so you can go into google maps and you use the street view and you're able to walk around the landscape with all the students on blackboard able to uh, follow along and very importantly i didn't jump from site to site as i was doing this i actually moved the cursor through the landscape as if they were on uh, a field trip actually out in the field so that they got the experience of observing the entire landscape and not just the particular sites that we uh, isolated but because it was virtual we also then have the possibility of something that Fraser was talking about. So in Google Maps Street View, there is a little time machine. So in this case, this is uh, Moss Street in the most recent Google Maps uh, Street View image. Uh, but we can go back to 2009 and we can see the same street and you're able to do this as you couldn't do this in, in the field so easily. And in fact, what we see here is a very important example of very early Dublin Corporation uh, tenement building construction from about 1913 in Moss Street, which uh, was not protected for some reason or other, did not have heritage protection and was subsequently demolished and is now replaced. If you go into the field today, that is now replaced by a, by a huge uh, modern building on that site. So Google Maps Street View then provided a very simple method of actually conducting a field trip uh, virtually. But because it's virtual as well, you can draw in other resources. So for example, as we were going through the Google Maps Street View, then I was able then to take the students in to other resources such as heritagemaps.ie, which is a, a map-based uh, database, which enables you to go in. And very importantly, heritagemaps.ie includes different base maps. So you can go right back to the mid 19th century and look at the first edition ordnance survey, you can look at the 1900 Ordnance Survey, you can look at the 1930s Ordnance Survey, and you can use contemporary uh, aerial photographs. So in the course of trekking around the landscape virtually, 
you can also then draw in this other sort of information. And heritagemaps.ie then also includes databases, such as, for example, on these blue dots here, the uh, National uh, Inventory of Architectural Heritage. And you can go into those little blue dots, pull up some basic information, and then link through to the National Inventory for Architectural Heritage and get some very good detailed information on the buildings that we were looking at. And the students then could uh, return to this in due course as they were uh, preparing their reports. So the, um, what we, I did then was uh, try to replicate an actual field trip experience in a completely virtual environment, but then was able to take advantage of things you could do in the virtual environment, such as linking with other databases or such as using the, uh, the time machine in Street View uh, to enhance the, uh, the field trip experience. And then the students, uh, the assessment was also digital. So they used a very simple platform called um, Story Maps and by the Night Lab. And they, this is a free, easily accessible uh, platform where you can construct a spatial narrative for basically where you can pin slides onto uh, a map and, and demonstrate a spatial narrative. And this is one of the students' um, story maps and they, they go through the different buildings. So they show them, they, they were able to take uh, screen grabs from the uh, Google Maps Street View. In this case, they were also then able to put in their own drawings, which they made as they were, um, as they were looking at the images on the, the Street View. And then they were also able to draw on the historic map information in heritagemaps.ie to show the development of that particular landscape over time. So what I found was that it was perfectly possible then to conduct a field trip completely virtually and give the students some experience of actually doing a field trip. And of course then with safety uh, requirements taken into account, the students were able to go back on their own into this landscape and maybe take photographs or look at the landscape themselves. Some of the, uh, the longer term learning for this for me in terms of things I would do differently as a result of this, I have subsequently included little mini field trips within lectures in modules, which is very easy to do in class now. And I've found that it's, it's really good in my historical geography module or my Trinity elective on Irish landscapes, uh, that you can actually go and, and conduct a little field trip within a lecture. And I found that a real enhancement to, uh, to my teaching. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Mark. That's absolutely fascinating and really great to see how you can bring things forward um, into, into future practice and other um, modules you're doing. So finally, we have uh, Anna Davis's uh, presentation on mission uh, greenhouses. Um, so I'm just gonna play this video. COVID social distancing over the past two years dramatically highlighted just how important our immediate surroundings are to our health and well-being. It also revealed the massive disparities in access to public green spaces and green infrastructure for people, particularly in urban areas. In the Greenhoods Field Day, we gave students the opportunity to connect with their micro geographies, the world immediately around them, and critically explore their experiences within their five kilometre world. Drawing on the landmark work of Mike Lynch's image of the city, mapping edges and landmarks, pathways and roads, Students were asked to create a mental map of their five kilometre worlds without consulting any formal maps and noting any green spaces or green infrastructure, highlighting three of them that were important to them within that. They were asked to compare these with a cartographical map of the area to explore any differences between the two. Then students were asked to map green spaces and green infrastructure on the cartographic map and plot a five kilometre transit walk through their map through one of their key green spaces. Walking along this route, they were asked to take notes, photos, sketches, creating a transit walk map. Finally, they were asked to survey their selected green space, describing positive and negative features and devising a plan for the green area to enhance its quality and accessibility, thinking about what would be required to make those improvements and what barriers might inhibit their implementation. Many students are attracted to geography because of the amazing environments in far off places around the globe. 
from the Amazon rainforest to the Great Barrier Reef. The COVID constraints allowed us to emphasise the importance of micro-geographies, our everyday home landscapes. That was also very interesting and thanks Anna. Iris, do you want to round up and, 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 and tell us what you'll bring forward or? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think overall in the, it, 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 as these kind of individual presentations showed, we've, we've all, I think, experienced exposure to um, particular methods for conveying information to students that we hadn't previously thought of. So for me in the soils practical, that was really the, the smartphone apps and the um, sort of lower key sampling and analysis methods that I really, I, I think, you know, I've never really thought that we should really bring that in. And particularly if we have really large classes as well, where it's difficult to bring students into the lab, you know, to get them to do some of this independently and, um, and in, in, you know, even in, in their home environment is so much um more, makes it so much more flexible for us to teach them these kinds of methods and then we've seen this with Mark's and, and Kian's presentation and also with Anna's there that this um, bringing in uh, a sort of digital method for analyzing and viewing and processing data is also something that I think all of us are bringing into the face-to-face the -face teaching now. Um, I also think that's really interesting, and this is the, the link with Fraser there is on this, uh, the, the diversity of students and their needs in this teaching, and that we really uh, should think about what is it about these new methods that we are now developing that suits particular students to make sure that we, we have a wider reach to a more diverse set of students who maybe find it otherwise less accessible, this information. Um, I do think there are there are always challenges. There are always the flip sides of the of the coin. You know, there's obviously the if we make the assessment diverse, uh, then the criteria for marking and so on have to be. You know, we have to look at those really carefully and make sure that they are equitable across the board, and so on. So it's it is something. I think it's an evolving thing, and I think the the one thing that does come out of it for me is that we just these sort of events are great, and we need to keep talking about our experiences in order to never really stand still and you know think about the next thing. Yeah, that's great, Iris. Really agree with you there about thinking about the diversity of, of students and the fact, you know, the things that technology has shown us over the last couple of years in many different arenas of how it can make it more accessible for some students. And yes, the 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 issue around getting the criteria and the rubrics is is also um, you know, it's, it's also one to, to explore. Um, and thanks very much. Uh